it's seven and I think we'll go ahead. Um, I'll do a few little introductions and stuff here. Um, just to let everybody know we are recording this so it will be available on the YouTube channel and then I'll also uh, share it to our Facebook page as well. So um, I know I had some people message me earlier. I'm sure they're probably still outside doing some stuff and wanted to be able to watch it. But um, I'd like to welcome you to our 2023 Munch on This series. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Trish Faring, the field representative for the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition. Um, my husband and I ranch north of Beach about 12 miles. Um, this evening with us, we have Jerry Doan. He is our past chairman and also a mentor for the Grazing Lands Coalition. And Jerry's going to be talking about the top 10 tips for profitability. Uh, next week is John Abizade with the Vents Company um, talking about virtual fencing. And then we will wrap up the following week on April 27th with Jay Fear uh, from the Minokin Farm. And he will be talking about cover crops, uh, moving the carbon dial. The, like I said, the series will be recorded. And then I also wanted to mention a couple of upcoming events that we do have on the calendar. Uh, June 21st will be the Grazing Land Coalition Summer Tour. Um, my husband, Donnie, and I will be hosting that here at our ranch north of Beach. And then on July 18th is the Leopold Tour, which is at the Lance and Anissa Gartner Ranch at Glen Olin, North Dakota. So a couple other things that we have um, that don't have dates set is a policy tour I believe sometime in August. And then we are also going to be doing kind of a road show um, traveling across the state of North Dakota uh, to the different soil conservation district areas or some uh, tours or workshops as well. Um, those dates have not been set yet. Um, for those of you that are not members of the Grazing Lands Coalition, I would encourage you to check out our website, our Facebook page, um, become a member of the Grazing Lands Coalition. Um, one of the uh, tasks that I have is working with our mentor program. If you're ever looking for anybody to toss around an idea with, I can hook you up with one of our mentors. Um, we also, I also offer grazing land planning um, with producers, tossing around ideas, um, looking, helping you look for a cost share for projects that you're looking at doing and things like that. So um, without further ado, Jerry, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you and we'll get this started. All right. Well, thanks, Trish, and <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, I know it's a busy time of the year, and uh, everybody's got plenty of things to do. It's been a crazy year. We'll probably talk about it a little bit as we get through this. And uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little different. I'm kind of used to talking over a PowerPoint, but I thought I'd try to be a little more informal and just talk from my heart a bit. Uh, I was asked to do this sort of a presentation at the National Grazing Lands uh, Coalition meeting in, I think, Reno a year or two ago. And I racked my brain on uh, what I really thought were 10 or so thoughts or ideas, principles that really made a difference on, on our place. And so that's kind of what this talks about. And if you, uh, if you want to challenge me or you want to ask questions, I mean, you can send them off to Trish if you want, and she can ask them. Or if you want to just interrupt me and ask, I mean, I, I just assume we learned something here tonight and be informal. I don't pretend to have all the answers. Uh, it's like I always say, the principles are the same. You've got to adapt them to your own operation and, and uh, make them work for you. Just a little bit, if you don't know me, many of you do, but I... Uh, Ranch in uh, Southern Burley County. Uh, our family, you know, my great grandfather started this place in 1882. So we're multi generational. I have three boys that are directly involved here with me, and my daughter also helps some. And my wife still is the boss. And if you see her name is on the computer, even. So, <laughs> so I, it took me a long time to figure that all out, but I, I know it now. So, <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, it's, uh, like I said, it's been a challenging year. I think I'll start this by saying, uh, those of us in regenerative agriculture got our butts kicked a little bit this year. I think maybe more so than, than maybe traditional egg, just, uh, 
and Mother Nature will humble us all. And I got a number of calls from people frustrated and, <laughs> and I was just as frustrated, but I'd always, the advice I always gave, and sometimes it was hard for me to take my own advice was step back and look at the big picture. It's still good if you're in regenerative egg, there's still positives, even though, and we had death loss here, the smaller calves, didn't take that 70 blow windshield good in December. Those older cows didn't take that windshield good. So it was, it was struggling. And as we get to talking about cover crops, I'll tell you the challenges we had with all of that. So I, uh, I definitely, uh, you know, I'm old enough to where I remember 1997 and this is right up there with it. And the good news is, and we're still pretty much covered with snow here. We're starting to see some bare ground. But a lot of this moisture is going in because we didn't freeze. So there's, there's a silver lining to this, but us, like many folks on the call and around the country, we're running out of feed and we've got to get out on something. And we still do have cover crops under the snow bank. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we get there, but enough of that for now, I'll get into this. And again, this is informal. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Or let's have a good discussion or pin me down, whatever you'd like. So I'll just start with number one. And in my opinion, one of the best things you can do for profitability on a farm or ranch or whatever you're doing is go to holistic management, take a holistic management course. It changed the way I, I think. And many of you have probably been through one, but I tell people, even if you're not going to graze a cow, go take a class because it teaches you how to think again. You know, I've got a degree from North Dakota State University and, you know, it was a great time. <laughs> you learn all the social aspects and all the fun things. And I got married while I was there and all those good things. But sometimes I think they miss, <clears throat> it's too bad in your senior year, you somehow don't pull it all together in a little holistic management would be good. But I took my initial training from Alan Savory himself, went back through a, another class and, and uh, it kind of changed the way I think. And if you've heard me speak before, or I use this quite a bit, and I don't want to get off on tangents here, but we're taught in black and white in higher education or even in school. And there's nothing in life and and dang sure nothing in agriculture on ranch that's black and white. We're all in holes and we're all in grays. And so to have, and when I came out of college, I was like everybody else, just give me the page number. Where's it written? Where's the key to profitability? I'll look it up and I'll apply that technology or that practice and live happily ever after. And quite honestly, it damn near broke me like a lot of folks. And I'm not trying to criticize higher ed. There's a lot of good things that come of all that, but we don't learn how to really use our head as much as we should anymore. So again, my number one thing is, and, and not that it's the most important, but it's right up there is to uh, go through holistic management and then embrace it. And, and we've really tried to live by it. Do we do everything perfectly according to the holistic management book? No, but we dang sure uh, are two, and I don't even have this written down on anything, but our two key, key principles or goals in that is to bring profitability back to this ranch and improve our quality of life when we do it. The two key things that I think in general in agriculture we miss, we generally accept that we're not profitable and we generally don't have that much fun doing it. And, and I think we really have to work to get that back We've proven on this place because we weren't profitable. I'm old enough again. I went through the 80s. The guys that I admired the most, there's not a one of them in business, not a one of them that I thought had it made were really on top of it. And, and that's sad. And, and uh, we saw this place erode pretty good too. And it's part of what changed me. I won't go into that a lot, but that's for another that could be a whole talk on, on my mentality and what caused me to do what I did or how we got there. So I think enough said, cause I, I, I don't want to run out of time on this thing. So then if we move into number two, 
as you go through all that, a thing that's made a huge difference on this place is planned rotational grazing. Call it the term you want. There's 50 terms out there on, on what you call it, but it's short duration, high animal impact, long rest and recovery, and call it whatever you like. But it's, it's what the buffalo did in the Northern Plains before we were here. Massive herds went through, grazed the land, urinated, put dung on the land, trampled it, and moved on and didn't come back for a year or two or three. And we had this abundant grassland that Lewis and Clark said was saddle high. And so we don't have those million head of animals to do that with. So we have to do it with fencing. And it's, again, short duration, high animal impact, long rest and recovery. Um, just a couple tidbits I'll say for the benefit of the landscape, I really like once over the best. We've seen tremendous difference. We've got some, we're just six miles off the Missouri River. We've got some real sandy, almost like uh, uh, the Nebraska Sandhills land. And <clears throat> season long grazing had made that very narrow diversity, mostly. Uh, Blue gramma grass was probably the prom prominent uh, species left, a lot of bare ground, not much cover on it at all. And with using planned rotational grazing, we've seen big blue stem move up those slopes, uh, prairie, uh, uh, purple prairie clover comes in, lots of, which is the legume, uh, lots of diversity come back. Those hills are virtually covered and and it's amazing that that seed bank was still there and you start to see that difference. So I think one of the, something that can really make a difference, we talked about this the other day at, at our grazing, uh, North Dakota Grazing Land Coalition uh, board meeting we had, we got into some good discussion and it was about seeing a difference and, and, and grazing and what you can do and could you double your herd size or, or, or should we take a more conservative approach and say you could have it again? And, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you you can double or triple or whatever. I do know we run way more livestock on this ranch than we ever had and are considerably more profitable. And I don't get too caught up into, did we double? Did we have it? Did we this? I get more looking at the big picture and uh, that's what I concern myself with and try not to get down in the trench too, too much because if I get into the trenches too much, I start to worry too much and I start to second guess myself. And, 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 and I proved that, that that doesn't work. I did it a whole lot this winter and I know better. So, um, all right, that's, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth on these unless you guys pin me down with questions because I, I'm going to whip through these and then at the end, you know, if, if there's time, we can certainly go back and visit them. Gary, Number three that I think is, yeah, go ahead. Would you touch a little bit in it, in addition to this topic you were just talking about, um, when do you, when did you start to notice a change once you implemented that plan? I noticed the change, the first fence I put in, you know, and, and, and I started very slow and I, I kind of recommend that because you've got to get your mind right. If you start too fast, your mind isn't there yet and, and you can have some issues and it is more work. It's more thinking. It's more, you know, it's just different and, and neighbors think you're crazy and all that sort of stuff. But how I started was I just took one big pasture and split it twice and I had three pastures and I just rotated and it was probably a month in each one, but but I, and then I observed and I said, wow, this looks better. And, and that's how I started. And then we split again, or we added more to it. And, you know, and now we've got a hundred and some different pastures. And, uh, you know, rotate every, Jace, Jace uh, criticized. I say one to seven days. And he said, we don't rotate one day very often, but we, every once in a while we do. So, so if he's, if I don't know if he's listening tonight or not, but he'll, 
he'll tell me where I screwed up somewhere along the line. But anyway, and again, that's not set in stone. It's monitor, replan. That's what holistic management's all about. I will never, ever, ever, if I live to be 200 years old, feel like I move at the right time every time. I think that's impossible. Should have stayed a day longer, should have moved two days earlier, whatever it is. The key, though, is when you have many pastures to move through or and even if you're, you know, if you're poly wire and everything, we don't do a lot of that a little bit, but we don't do a lot. Ours are more permanent. But you can screw up a bit. And because you've got a long rest and recovery period, you'll be fine. So don't beat yourself up over that. And every once in a while, and I've come to the, I never used to believe in this, but I do now. And Mr. Fear, and I've talked about this a lot. I think sometimes you have to shock the system. And that may be just graze one down to the, to the nubs. And, but don't do it every year and don't do this, you know, at the same time. But you shock it. And I've done that and, and wait a year or two. And that might be your best pasture. It, it got rid of a lot of, you know, you can take the selectivity away from cattle if you do this a while. And, but, you know, you got to be careful because you will mess up performance a bit when you get screwing around making your land so good. But so it's a balance in there. And uh, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit, Tricia. Um, well, I'll move on a little bit here and uh, we'll revisit some of these things. Don't worry about production per animal. We're all hung up on that in the world, you know, and everybody likes to brag about weaning weights or, or uh, bull performance or whatever it is. I think we've messed up a whole lot of things by doing that. Start thinking about production per acre or some measurement of holes. And if you do that, that's where profitability is. Um, little calves aren't bad if they're profitable. Big calves are not good if they're not profitable. And I think there's more big calves that aren't profitable than little calves that, that, that aren't. And, you know, and maybe it's a balance in the middle. Our calves are a lot smaller than they used to be, but they dang sure are on the profitable side compared to what we used to be but what we've done in in animal agriculture and all you have to do is look at any chart of the cow size and it's off the charts you know there's cows selling at 2,000 pounds we had a vet here one day that said he came from from a place and they uh, were weighing the cows as they pg'd them and they averaged 2,000 pounds and i'm not saying that's wrong but he asked to see the thousand pound calves that came out of them if you're trying to get 50%. And of course there weren't any. And again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what kind of cattle to raise, you know, what color, pink, blue or green, I don't care. But, but I do know our, our production models that we generally are promoting around the country are destined to fail. And I believe that because I was in that model for a long, long time. And, and uh, you know, and I am a product of a land grant university and I'm not trying to step on. Jerry, hold on a second here. Somehow we got you muted. So can you unmute yourself again? I think I did it on accident, letting somebody else into the meeting. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Hear me now? Yep. We're good. Okay. All right. How much did I, did you miss? Not much. Now I can't hear you. Probably like 10 to 20 seconds, I would say. Okay. Well, the, the final point I made was don't get into the production per animal paradigm. Look at production per acre or production in some whole system type thing. All right. Next thing is calving in sync with nature. You know, I was just like everybody else. We calved our heifers in barns, thought it was fun all night long. When I was younger, maybe it was sort of fun, but it not that much fun anymore and I haven't done it in 20 years 
the number one best economic decision I ever made was moving to May and June calving. Honestly, one of the key numbers for profitability on this ranch. We lost a hundred calves to scours one year when we were calving in the March, April, early April type thing. Just, and it wasn't, you know, every, we'd send them in and, uh, you know, it was various pathogens that were taking them, but it was stress that was causing the problem. It wasn't, you know, you can kill yourself with vaccines and mineral programs and all that stuff and, and scour remedies. And I tried them all, did them all and just absolutely was killing myself. And, and one of the hardest decisions I ever made was to move because I went to the animal science department at NDSU and asked them for all the research on May and June calving. I knew personally the uh, chairman at the time of the animal science department, and I got a half a page. That's not something that was ever really looked at at that time and probably not really that much since because it's not, it's outside of the norm of when a lot of folks have. And finally, I just, I said, this isn't working. I've got to do something different or quite honestly, I'm going to quit because it's not fun. And I had to just kind of beat my head against the wall and make the decision. And, and I've never looked back. It's now you have to do some things a little different. You can't just wean off the cow and sell them. They're going to be, I'm not, you could, but they're light, you know, and, but, you know, we either take them to grass, sell them to go to grass or those kinds of things. And uh, it's been a real uh, profitability button for us. So I, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. The deer don't have their fawns in the middle of the winter. So I don't know why it took us all this time to figure this out. So number five would be get your cattle type right for your system and then fitting your livestock to your landscape. Again, as I go back to the chart of cow size in the United States, we've got these huge cows that are high input. They're not made for grass. We bred it right out of them. And it's selecting for high EPDs for milk and growth and, and uh, yearling weight and all those good things. And I'm not saying that's all bad, but we've created something that does not fit us guys that want to get back to what a ruminant is supposed to do. And that's converting cellulose to a good product. Many of those cows need high inputs, which takes your profitability right away. I was in that paradigm. I mean, we crossbred, you know, we've been, my, my grandfather brought the first Angus cows to Southern Burley County in 1930. People, that's why the name's Black Leg Ranch. They hated them. They were them black-legged SOBs. And he was a character enough that he named it that. But those were grass cattle. <laughs> and we bred that right out of them. And so did we. I had fiddled with several of the big breeds, chasing, crossbred, all that good stuff. And there's some good to it all. But all of a sudden, you've got these... Big animals, high input, low profitability, and struggling to make it work. And, and so we brought our cow size down. I always say 1,100 pound cow is what I want. We've got some smaller than that. We've still got some that are a little bigger than that. <clears throat> but, and, and if you can do it on 1,500 pound cows or whatever, God bless you. I'm not going to tell you that's wrong. It's just, I know what works here. The big cows don't work as well. And we can run more of these smaller cows. We use some Aberdeen to bring them down quick. Aberdeen is, you know, the small, used to be the low line breed. They renamed it to Aberdeen, just to confuse the hell out of all of us. So we, uh, <clears throat> but it'll bring them down in a hurry. You can get some that get a little too small, but the Aberdeen breed is really pretty efficient, really meaty type animal. They really have a good place, particularly in the uh, grass finished end of these things. But so we brought them down. We're not using as much on them now. We got them down to where they're coming along. One of the issues, and I'll tell you the weak spots in this stuff, because I'm, I'm honest that way. We had trouble with our heifers. When you go from, you know, 
pouring the corn to heifers and yeah, I can get these things all bred if I pour the corn to them, but it's against what I'm trying to do. So we're selecting and then your breeding falls off. Johann Zietzman was here and he said, be patient, keep selecting. I said, Johann, I don't have any patience anymore and I wanna get there quicker. And you know, he, he claimed he could go to Africa and these, these un, uh, unrefined herds and get where we, the cattle we wanna get to much quicker than we can with the cattle that are out there in the country today. So, you know, if he's right or wrong, he, I mean, he's done it long enough, he's probably right. But anyway, however you do it, you've got to find the cattle that fit your landscape and fit your system. And you can't just take cows that are used to high input, kick them out on grass and the system that I've developed and expect it to work because you'll have trouble with breed back, you'll have trouble with a number of things. So that's, that's a pretty important thing. And it, it's hard to do. It's hard to go find them. There's some out there, but they're not just on every corner. And I've went and bought some neighbor's cattle. I thought they were moderate framed heifers and they fell out of my herd within three years. They just don't work. They come in looking like, you know, they've been cubed a whole bunch or, and, and, and again, he's, I'm not trying to criticize. They're good people. But then I get into this lower, lower cost cows work for me system and they fall out right away. So you got to develop that. All right. Number six is utilize low maintenance bulls, calving knees, longevity, and made for grass. And they're not that easy to find either. There are getting to be more and more herds out there. I think Trish and Donnie have went down that path and there's others <coughs> that uh, are breeding those kind and and uh, so you got to go find them and and try to utilize them one of the things I don't think we I think it's kind of funny in a way and I know longevity isn't the most heritable trait out there but I think we've really missed it and uh, I know uh, I've heard I better be careful. I'm going to get myself in trouble if I start saying too many things about stuff I know. <laughs> anyway, longevity, I think, is important. There are some in the industry that think that's a waste of time. But yet, if we can't get cows stay in this herd for a while, you know, the dairy industry turns over their turns over their cows very rapidly. And if that's what we do, I think longevity is the key to profitability. And even if it's a little less heritable, I still, I've been selecting bulls for it for a while and I'm hoping that we can start. Are you there, Trish? Renee. You're good, Jerry. Okay, it all blacked out. I don't know what happened. Oh. No, I can still see you and hear you, so. Okay, well, you were all black. I thought it went dead here, and I was, oh. <laughs> I was about no. to scream that this thing quit working. Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. It's fine. <clears throat> anyway, I think longevity is important, and, and a number of other traits, obviously. Uh, gainability on grass. We bred that out of most of these cattle. And, and, and not to pick on the purebred industry, but there is no incentive to change that. What do we do when we go into a bull sale? I mean, a lot of folks, you buy the highest EPD for growth, highest EPD for milk, the highest EPD for yearling weight, and then wonder why your cows are 1,600 pounds and, you've, and they don't gain very well on grass. So those people are doing, I mean, they're making, they've got a heck of a profitability model. I don't think it's good. It isn't good for us kind of guys because they don't fit. But, you know, more power to them. They're my friends and I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to offend them or to say that that's all bad. But in this system, you've got to find bulls that'll work and get back to this grass ability and gainability on grass that we've bred out of them. And so that's pretty important to uh, profitability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number seven would be uh, regenerate, regenerate. Soil health, both in rangeland and cropland, and I'm not going to spend a 
whole ton of time here on soil health, but there's a couple of key principles that have made a huge difference here. And uh, we'll talk, first off, it's cover crops. And uh, I'll talk a little more about that when I get into winter grazing, so I'll leave it alone. But then crop rotation, and we try to have all four crop types, you know, your uh, cool season uh, grass and broadleaf and your warm season grass and broadleaf in that rotation somehow somewhere and maybe it's part of it's in with the cover crop in a rotation but that starts to build soil health back and uh, make a huge difference I, i'm sure most of you know the principles of soil health and i mean they're key on this place it's uh, keep litter on the soil you know more plant diversity uh, keep a living root which doesn't work very good when it's 70 below wind chill, but under all that snow, there probably was one growing somewhere. So that part's good. And then little or no soil disturbance. And I say no, unless it's absolutely necessary and then get livestock on the land. That livestock on the land is key. Folks come up to me all the time and say, can we build soil health without livestock? Because a big chunk of this, state and country doesn't want livestock anymore. Yeah, I guess you probably can, but it's gonna be so ungodly slow by comparison that it would sure be nice to get livestock back on. So I won't spend, I know you'll probably have, I mean, we always spend a lot of time on soil health and I won't go down that path very much unless there's questions, but I dang sure believe in it. And regenerative ag is important, I think it's, the savior to the world. And maybe at the end, we can talk a little more on that. Uh, the next one fits right in. It's no-till. We've been no-till for, I don't know, 25 years or whatever. And to be honest, I wasn't all that, I was on the state board of ag research at the time when we had some no-till projects coming through NDSU and I wasn't all that sold. And now I see I was an idiot because it's made a huge difference here and and on this sandier ground it's just a huge difference and there's a couple of key things that are so important in this soil health no-till the whole thing it's it's litter on the ground on this sandy ground we need litter on the ground and then we need to get the infiltration. We need the water going in, not down the hill in the creek. And then we don't want it evaporating. I never got this for a lot of years. And, and uh, you know, if you keep that soil temperature, you've got that litter there. And, and Mr. Fear knows this well when we, it was the aha moment for me when we had the, the researcher from Australia here that time. And, went out in the cover crop field and she stuck a thermometer in it was 70 degrees or 68 I think but at 70 all the moisture goes to the plant and when you get up to 140 all the bacteria and everything's dead and that's when it finally made all the sense in the world to me we've got this water quality issue that's huge in the country and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and we better be paying attention. So we don't want it going down the hill. We want it in the soil and we want it to infiltrate and we want the ground covered and we don't want to evaporate it. Then when we go through these droughts and I've, I've said to people with these couple of drought years, we build resilience into these regenerative systems. Now that doesn't mean you aren't gonna have issues with drought and mother nature isn't gonna humble you a bit but you do have resilience because it doesn't take as much moisture because we're utilizing what we get. And that's again, key to profitability. Uh, that whole soil health, that whole no-till no 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 system. And then building that soil biology. And you know, I, I guess if I would have had one slide to throw up, it's the difference we made in the structure of our soils and the worms in them and, and the, just the difference. And as we test it and we see that soil biology moving up the ladder, that's huge. And that helps this whole thing and, and makes it work. So enough about that for now. Um, talk a little bit about winter grazing. 
the number one uh, cost for cow guys or buffalo guys or sheep guys in the northern plains is winter feed costs. They kill us. And nobody, well, that's too strong. Very few research winter feed costs. Very few. There's a little more going on now than there used to be, but still not a lot. When we got into the cover crop thing and the first couple of years, you know, very little diversity, a couple of crops, a lot of weed pressure, maybe planting too late, lots of things. I wasn't all that impressed. And we sat down and said, what are we trying to do here? And our number one goal was to get rid of these winter feed costs because that's where profitability really is. Get rid of those winter feed costs. Number two was, could we bring soil health back on cropland that was completely depleted from years and years and years of summer fallow and wheat and terrible wind erosion and water erosion and all those things. And I didn't know if it could be brought back. And then the third was propagate the wildlife. And, you know, I'm pretty impressed that we're pretty successful on all those fronts. Now, this year did not work. <laughs> and this year was an aberration. I have grazed all year long through 200 year snowfalls, which is about what we are this year, or give or take. But it didn't all come like this year. And it didn't all come that early. And it came in pieces, cows could graze through it. This was one of those years when mother nature just slaps the crap out of you. You know, we here on this place, we got over two feet the first week of November and we tried to graze one cover crop field and we stressed those cows and it, and those little, those tail ender calves. And then, then the 70 below wind chill come in, in uh, December and we lost some of those and, and, I'd do things different if I had to do over again, but who, who knows that? And it just kept piling on. We, the poorest winter grazing year I've ever had. And we tried to, I kicked one bunch of cows out in January and tried to graze a cover crop field. And there was four or five foot snow banks on part of it, but some of it was down and they grazed kind of in a weird fashion through some of it. I got about two weeks out of that field, which because we're so short on hay might have saved me or at least helped quite a bit. So it, it was one of those years. It just didn't work quite right. Now I'm hoping and we're starting to thaw off and there's some cover crops that I didn't get to at all. And I'm hoping I'm going to, I'm going to put a bunch of yearlings on them. And I'm now we're, here's the million dollar question. Jay said yesterday, I'm going to get the semi, we're gonna haul cattle out and I'm looking out there going, I don't think we dare do it quite yet. Yeah, they might dig, but it's icy, muddy. I'm afraid we may ruin it and not get as good a utilization. So I said, I know we're almost out of hay, but if we could hold four days, you know, we're melting every day. I just, I think it might be safer. I don't know, I it's the million dollar question, but we have got to get to some a different feed source because we're almost out of hay. The thing about winter grazing, guys and gals, is you've got to have a backup plan. We had more hay this year than I've ever had, and we fed more hay than I have in at least five years put together. Uh, I've never in my life started feeding the first week in November and fed clear through till now. I never have. That is an aberration. And if I would have had the normal hay that I generally put up, we would have been out two months ago and we put up all this extra hay. I thought, man, there's no way we'll run out of hay. But we were free feeding so much, both to buffalo. Our buffalo herd was locked in all winter and they should have been grazing and they could have been, but the fences were all covered with snow banks. I was afraid they'd end up in South Dakota. And so we locked them in. It just drove me nuts. This is the dumbest thing ever to have to lock Buffalo in that should be grazing for you. So we, you know, we, it seemed like everything we did wasn't right. And 
And we try to, we've got hay yards out close to these cover crop fields so that if we have to supplement, we can without bringing them, ever bring them to a corral. We never bring them to a corral. Ended up, we couldn't get to the, those hay lots. There was so much snow, we couldn't even doze to some of them. So it was, the hay was in the wrong places. The uh, water was messed up. There wasn't anything went right, you know, and, and you guys all have your, your stories. And, and on top of all that, we had a shop cave in and we lost a semi and three tractors in there that are just a mess. Two of them are still in the rubble that we're not sure how to get them out yet. But anyway, enough of my problems here, but, <clears throat> but uh, winter grazing is the key to profitability. Year in and year out, we'll average a couple hundred dollar savings per cow. These high cost hay years, that could go clear up to three, four hundred dollars a year. But even if you can peel off a month or two, it's huge. And yet most people are afraid to do it. And, and uh, the FSA will discourage you from doing it. They say it's not approved. And... Uh, and that's sad. I think we, we, we really, you know, we're, we become way too dependent on them for things. And, uh, well, that's, a, <clears throat> another whole munch. I could go into some of that nonsense. It's just shameful, but, and then the other issue is some people don't understand it. And when there's cows out there in the snow grazing, they think you're abusing animals. They don't have a clue that, that it works and what you can do though and we've done this is use the nut ball if you're not familiar with that it's a nutritional balance or program out of texas a&m you take manure samples you send it in it'll give you a snapshot of what those cattle are performing at or what they should be off of what they're eating and going through them and generally when we do that we're we're making we're hitting their target see that's one of the keys to moving your calving back bringing your cow size down or getting your cow, your cow uh, type to your system. And if you have that, then the nutritional, you don't care if they're gaining a bunch, you just don't want them losing a bunch. You want to keep their body condition score where it is. But the key then is when we supplement, we supplement out there. See, we, we're trying to not we're trying to improve the water quality. When we bring them into a corral and feed them there, where are most of our corrals, they're on a watershed. Ours ends up in Apple Creek, well, Long Lake Creek into Apple Creek into the Missouri River. People downstream don't want that. And we better pay attention. You know, a judge just ruled today on the, on the waters of the U.S., thank God, and, and back that down again for the third time, you know, every these administrations, they want to control us on this water issue. But the point is, we better pay attention. And if we do the right thing, then maybe we wouldn't have so many regulations. So we supplement, I mean, you can cube them out there, you can have alfalfa hay out there, particularly when you get into third trimester, we try to keep our better cover crop for that third trimester in a normal year, you know, throw this year out, nothing worked right. But that's, that's our goal. And uh, right now we are grazing some cows. We just put all the old cows are out on a cover crop and we're, and we don't have very good quality. We fed all our good quality hay when we were struggling through that really cold streak, just trying to keep them alive. So now we're on not very good quality hay, but there we're putting some out there and they're not really liking it. So it's telling me that they're like, they just love browsing. They're sick and tired of standing in a the corral. They're not used to it. So so it's a good thing. And, and uh, you know, if, if it looks like we're really running a little short, we may cube these a little bit. I don't know. We're so ungodly muddy that that's a little risky that, you you know, there's stomp cubes in the ground right now. But we'll see how that all shakes out and uh, how the weather, uh, you know, we've got some native range that we didn't use that's in pretty good shape we can go to yet and, and these cover crops. So we're trying to figure this all out we're, we're in a little different territory and and uh, we'll learn some things so uh what did i miss on uh oh the backup plan you you've got to have you know you can go sell all your hay equipment but you're gonna have to buy so you got to have a backup plan because if you get into was three years ago we had an issue and we had those three 
blizzards all within two weeks. And we had to, you know, we had to pull out of them cover crops. We kept them out there, portable windbreaks and that sort of thing. But you had to feed out there, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and we were able to go back to them a little bit later on in the winter. It straightened out a little bit. And, and uh, so it's, it's a moving target. You have to learn as you go, but you need some type of backup plan to get you through it. But if you can save a couple hundred bucks and really bring some profitability back to the ranch, that's a good thing. Jerry, we have Let's a question see. in the Should chat. I move along in? Yeah, go ahead. Um, on a year like this, do you try to supplement with energy or protein? Good question. Well, it depends on what you're really needing. I mean, you know, most of the year, this year, it was so ungodly cold, we needed energy pretty bad. Now going into this, you know, where they're going to start calving, we're probably short of protein, especially like us on this poor quality hay. You know, I, the other option would be, and I was considering this, maybe some tubs, you know, I, some protein tubs might, might be an answer to help out. You know, I'm, I'm cheap. I don't want to spend more money because I, I want profitability. But on the other hand, you can, you know, these cows, uh, they're actually looking better now than they did. They went in, came, came off grass in not the best shape. I didn't talk about this, but our, you know, a lot of people in North Dakota had, we had all that rain and then it quit in July and we had a lot of fluff, but not much quality. And our body condition had went downhill in the fall there as, as we were grazing. And then we got hit with that snow and then that terrible cold and those cows were not in the best condition. We've, and that's why we're, we don't have the good feed left. We, we worked really hard to try to bring that body condition back on them. And I think we did in general, and we still got a few cows thinner than I'd like to see, but in general, they're in pretty good shape now. So you got to kind of analyze that, which, which you need. And, and, you know, that's where you could, uh, you could take a look at the nutritional balancer. If you're out here grazing these cover crops, and I haven't done that because we just got them out there, but it wouldn't be bad to, you know, if I'm into this a couple of weeks, go grab a sample, send it in, see what it says see if it's way out of whack and that would help us. And if it's halfway close, then maybe we're good. But, you know, we going into this, you know, uh, these cows will be calving, right? Just, they might be just a little before May 1st, around May 1st. So they're getting closer and uh, we don't really want to short them too bad right now. So hopefully that helps some. Number 10 would be, uh, Look for niches or stacking enterprises. We've done a lot of that here. And uh, I think it's the key as we move forward in this world. Um, I think every producer on here has an unfair advantage, but you won't know what it is probably. It, you're too close to it. One unfair advantage we have is we're only 25 miles from Bismarck. That major airport made a huge difference in people that come here, both for hunting, tourism, those sorts of things. I never thought anything about it and probably wouldn't, wouldn't have if we wouldn't have kind of discovered that. There's probably others that aren't so dominant, but most of the people that I've talked to across the country that have got into agritourism or some kind of enterprise have some unfair advantage. Uh, I, I use this example of a, a place in Nebraska. I got to speak with this lady on a forum once and they had a river going through there and they started an enterprise called tanking. And it's, they take a stock tank, they put a seed in it, you can put your friends in there. You bring your cooler of beer or pop or water, whatever you want. They drop you off at one end of the river, <clears throat> float to the other end. They pick you up and they were charging like 80 bucks or something like that. And they were making a lot of money. And I mean, most people would never think of that or have the courage to try it because it is something different. You got to deal with people. You do have some liability risk and all that. Another, uh, 
gal in Florida that I was uh, privileged to be on a forum with, they just, uh, you know, and they had their unfair advantage was they had a million people not very far away. So they planted sunflowers, the wild ones in a field, 20 acres, sold a cup for five bucks or something on Mother's Day, said, pick your mother a bouquet of sunflowers. And they had cars lined up for three or five miles and sold the whole field out. They made a boatload of money on that. And I was just in awe of both of them, like, wow, you really thought outside the box on those, you know? And I, I think we're, 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 you know, we send, we tend to have blinders on, and I was no different than anybody else. You know, you grow up in agriculture, you raise cows, you grow wheat, you grow corn, whatever it is, and you, that's what you do. And, but I do think we need to look at this a little different. And maybe it's just some niche with your cow herd. If it's, you know, I think there'll be as, hopefully as we move the, the whole soil health, human health down the road, there'll be some niches for a particular market, maybe that offers some mineral in the, say in the meat or whatever it may be. I, you know, it's probably something totally out there. The one thing I would say in this whole deal, if you're planning to bring kids back to an operation, I really believe this sincerely, it's create some excitement and get out of the way. Because otherwise, I don't think they'll come back. And, I, you know, I've had the privilege to speak across the country and invariably somebody comes up to me, how did you ever get your kids to come back? Mine didn't. And if I talk to them for five minutes, I know why they didn't. It was nothing positive. And you've got to create some excitement. It's not, they're not going to come back like I did. I mean, I just was destined. That was what I was going to do. And, you know, my kids, I don't think would have come back here just to have a cow herd. Jace would have, the other two, not so much. They, they, they have a little bigger picture and that's all right. But stacking enterprises, whatever that might be, you know, we've got a number of things here. We added the hunting operation that's been the longest and it's, done extremely well uh meet a lot of great people it's a lot of work but it's a lot of work for three months not all 12 that led to the agritourism when jay came back which led to the brewery and and uh um a lot of excitement around that there's a lot of work in all that agritourism is a moving target you know, we do some weddings, we do lots of corporate events, we do all kinds of things from scrapbookers to family reunions to corporate events to, you know, uh, grazing tours, soil health tours, all that sort of stuff. But it's a moving target. Who knows where it will be in five years? That could completely change. There could be something different. And we're constantly thinking about that. Um, Weddings are kind of a pain. And if there was a way to do something different, I mean, I mean, don't take that wrong. I mean, there's great people. And, but, you know, you are dealing with alcohol and, and uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people are good. It's the one that you needed to stop at the gates. <laughs> but, but it's, uh, you know, we'll see where that all goes. And then, uh, you know, we've got the, the grass finished label both on bison and, and cattle or, or beef. And I think that has huge opportunity and Trish or anybody else on this that's doing this knows the issue. We don't have enough packing space to grow it as much as we, we could grow it considerably more, but unless we build a packing plant, which Trish has more guts than me to be involved in a packing plant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know somehow we got to get that figured out and 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 hopefully we do maybe it's <clears throat> in the uh, bison you know there's portable you can use portable for that and so i'll fit in south dakota you can't do that my understanding anyway in, in the beef yet and so maybe there's some things there that could be done so that's um oh there's one huge piece that I missed in stacking enterprises and it's custom grazing. 
I would have never, ever done custom grazing 25 years ago because I was just like every other rancher. I had to own it. I had to run it. I had, it had to be mine. It's the way I was. And it's our independent nature, which is all great until you go broke. <laughs> and custom grazing. See, my boys taught me some of this because they're more willing to try new things that show profitability right away. And custom grazing is a little different because you got to deal with somebody else, but you manage those cattle through your grazing system. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's got its benefits and it, it spreads your risk. And I tell a lot of young people, if you're going to get into this, don't buy cattle, custom graze for a bit, learn some things, spread your risk. It's been a huge profit center for us. And, uh, and we continue to do it. You know, there are years when you shouldn't own any, there are years when you should own them all. How do you figure that out? I'm kind of, my older boys are, let's not own any. My younger boy is let's own them all because he's like me. <laughs> He's a cowboy and that's what cowboys do. <laughs> I'm in the middle. Let's, let's spread it that way. And, and if we get into a drought year, it's our cows that suffer or our cows that we sell off or whatever it might be, because we want to make sure we keep our clients happy. So it's been a good thing for us. And, and we really work hard to try to do a good job for our clients and, uh, and, and, so it's been a profit center for us. We also uh, cut back on, we used to farm quite a bit. We cut back and we actually partner with some different guys on our cropland. We still plant all our cover crops, forage crops, but I don't, I don't, well, here's, here's my holistic training. I wanna get rid of those depreciable assets. I don't wanna own combines. I don't wanna own big air seeders. I didn't want to own the big tractors. We still have a, a lot of stuff, it seems, probably more than we should. But I, I'm of the belief that, you know, like our hay and equipment, we try to keep it decent. Yeah, we could not own it, but it's hard to get when I want it. So I haven't went down that path yet. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but I've tried to balance this some. But I don't want those big ticket items. And so we've partnered with, with guys and it's it's a crop rent type situation but we they get moved around a lot because they're in our soil health uh with our cover crops and our rotation and it again spreads our risks now the last last couple of years to be honest with you it was probably a mistake because the government gave boatloads of money to crop production and if we would have been running it all, we'd have probably been in better shape. I didn't, you know, who saw the pandemic coming in the aftermath of that and the big payments and all that. And we've talked about going back into it, taking it over. We're kind of tapped out on time and that's always an issue. And maybe we will at some point, but we'll, we've kind of, kind of kicked that can down the road a bit. I'm, I'm kind of conservative. I kind of like, uh, Not, or, or spreading my risks some. So uh, I don't tell that side of this much when I get out talking about it, but I'm trying to be really honest with you guys tonight and kind of tell you what I've done to, to kind of cement this place into better financial situation. Yeah, the couple, let's see how we doing on time. Well, we're just about out, getting close, but I'll just tell you a couple quick things. Invest in appreciable assets. You know, most, a lot of people want to invest in equipment and everything. And that, yeah, okay, that's fine, but it depreciates. Invest in land or things that appreciate. And I know that a lot of, you go to a lot of schools, they'll tell you to rent land and all that. It's all fine and good. And I know it keeps your costs down, but long-term to build wealth, it's hard to do it if you keep renting land all the time, if you don't plunge in. It's just, 
my experience, um, if you can somehow swing it to purchase, find somebody. And I think we've got to hook up more older guys that don't have kids coming back that'll give younger guys a break. And that's where we really need to be spending some effort. But I really believe for the benefit of long-term, if you can afford to purchase, you're better off. The other thing is if you can invest money outside of agriculture in some form, because most of you won't have enough to retire on. And I saw that with my folks. And so I was, I was dead set that I wasn't going to be in that same boat. And, and we have invested outside and it's, you know, those years when it was really tough, it was hard to put rub two nickels together to invest somewhere, but whatever it is. And I just started it and started to religiously invest in something. If it was outside real estate, if it was stocks or whatever it was, and not that I'm filthy rich or anything else, but, but we at least have something set aside that if I had to walk away from this because it was, uh, to put it in my boy's hands or whatever, they wouldn't have to make to buy my living if if it got that ugly, you know. And hopefully we don't. But I, that's my advice to you: is try to try to do that. And because I see in agriculture, most of us invest in our own operation. That's all great if you're going to sell it someday. But most of us aren't. If you have kids coming back, and then you can't sell it to them at the market price, or they're going to not be able to make it. And so then you give them a good deal or give it to them free, whatever. And then you don't have anything to go anywhere or do anything on. And so you got to sit down when you're younger and really think that through because it's a huge deal. And if you don't do it, you got the benefit of time when you're young. You can't wait till you're my age to start or you won't have anything. And the last thing I'll say is uh, when it's all said and done, go out and tell the story. That's a big part of what we do and why we do it. And it's with me every day. We're, we're losing the grasslands. We're losing our livestock industries in North Dakota. It's because of the unbalance between crops and, and livestock. Every day I'm on the phone with somebody, I'm telling the story because uh, we've got to tell it because nobody understands it. And, and some don't care, unfortunately. The water quality issue is huge. I think regenerative ag can be the leader in that. The, the whole uh, um, carbon sequestration, it's muddy as heck, but we need to be involved and we need to put that on the map. The other thing, the key that we have is how we protect and improve the natural resources through regenerative ag. We've got to get that message out there. And then we've got to get the message. If we lose the livestock industry and we lose the grassland, the wildlife will be gone. We have to get the public on our side to change this. And if we get all that done, then all this stuff is worthwhile. But we have to create profitability on these ranches and we have to have fun while we're doing it. Take, take time. Take time to go watch your kids' baseball game, go watch your kids' rodeo, go, go, go uh, buy a boat and go have some fun. We don't do that enough. And the other thing is, and I didn't do that for half my life, it's just drive through the pasture, ride through the pasture and smell the roses because we got a lot to be thankful for and we get so caught up in the chaos of the world that it isn't fun anymore. So that's kind of my synopsis on profitability that changed this ranch that struggled through the 80s. And uh, not that it's perfect, but if anybody has any other questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Jerry. Um, you are more than welcome to turn your cameras on, uh, turn your, shut your micro or turn your microphones on and uh, we can open it up for questions here if anybody has any questions for Jerry. I, agree. I do have one. I do have one question. Is I got on late on this. Is there a way to go back and start from the beginning? Yes, I will um, get this posted on our YouTube channel, and it will also be on our Facebook page. 
Thank you. You're sure welcome. Was there another question that came in about the same time? Maybe not. I see we have a few other mentors on here. One of you guys got to challenge me on some. I know. I was waiting for one of them. <laughs> I guess to, uh, I will ask if there is questions when I can go back and watch it from the beginning. Is there a way to ask questions later? Yes. Um, I can connect you up with Jerry. Um, you I can put my email out if you want. Okay. And it if you. If any of you want to, you know, I know you're all shy. So if anybody, you know, has a, has a thought or an idea or whatever, don't hesitate. To, it's on the it's on the Grazing Lands website anyway, but Trish could send it out if you want. And you're welcome to contact me anytime. Yep. Jerry's contact information is on the website. Um, both. I think you're I'm pretty sure you're either home phone or cell phone one of the two of them is on there or maybe both um and then email of course too so yes and feel free to reach out to any of our mentors katrina i see you you're unmuted yeah i just had a question it, it's kind of like totally off the wall from anything about this probably but can any of you enlighten me about how it works, um, I inherited a portion of our the ranch that I grew up with with my other two brothers. And my dad had it as an undivided interest in the ranch. And so I leased back those acres to my brother. And um, we have it set at like $7 an acre. And how, how do you know, or where, where do you, what is good guidance on that to know what is fair for him you know, if he's going to keep renting it for another 10 years or whatever, what's fair? That's a tough question. Okay. You're asking fair as far as price? Yeah, exactly. You know, something what? for my part and then some, but to be fair to my brother so that, I mean, that he doesn't seem like he's paid for it five times over. Right. Well, yeah, that's, you know, families are always a challenge, of course, and the, the one thing, you know, you may want to get a little legal advice, because when you start renting to family members before, below market price, and you get into any sort of a tax situation, they will come back at you. You know, you can do that outside of the family, but you can't do it within the family, and I'm by no means a legal expert on this, but I, I do know you, you just may want to have a little bit of advice. Uh, yeah, I mean, and you probably already know this, you can go online to the, I don't know, uh, just do a search on, on pasture and crop rents and for your county, it'll pop up, give you an average at least, and gives you some idea. You may already know all this stuff, but. Uh, yeah, if you search National Ag Statistics Service for North Dakota. Right. Katrina, is it in Weibo County? Um, no, it's in Fallon. Fallon County. Fallon. Okay, so that's what I <laughs> thought you told me. Katrina is the district conservationist in Weibo for NRCS. Oh, sure. For those of you on here. <laughs> yeah. One of my well, neighbors. Good luck with it. It's, you know, I don't know if we helped you a lot. It's a uh, with families, it's always difficult trying to balance the, the fairness with a decent rate. But if you get too high, then it's hard to make it work. So I, I get that. So, any other mentors want to pop in here and have anything to add? Trish, I would add to um, what Jerry was talking about custom grazing. One of the biggest benefits I've seen on that is from a cash flow standpoint. Um, it's a way to supplement if you've got a cow-calf operation, a yearling operation, things like that. You can set up to receive 
percentages of that expected custom grazing income at times of the year when you may be a little short on your cash flow from your other enterprises too. So it, it adds another level of, um, of spreading out risk from that standpoint too. You might not have to dip in as deep to an operating owner yeah. things like that. Chad, Robbie, Jean, Dave, <laughs> anybody? Susan says, thank you, Jerry, for a very informative presentation. I always learn something new from you. More people need to hear your story. I agree. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, you were talking about the, the processing facility. I, I think there might have been just a little bit of luck on when it came to that. That kind of fell into our lap a little accidental and it was probably one of the best things that we ever did. And, you know, you got to talking about investing outside of your ranch and, and that was another way for us to be able to, it, it's part of our ranch, but it's also outside of our ranch. So um, that was a big risk for us but, to take in our operation. But Trish, don't, don't sell yourself short. You know, when those opportunities arise, you took advantage of it so often we're always scared to do it. And, and I get that, you know, it's more risk is, can I handle it? Can I do this? But yet you, sometimes you got to step out and take that risk to make a difference. And, and I, and most of us in agriculture are pretty uh, cautious to do that. And, and, and don't, don't get me wrong. I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to risk everything I have to do something crazy. But on the other hand, to try to move the needle forward, you've got to step out a little bit once in a while and analyze it, but then not be afraid to act. So I, my hat's off to you for taking the opportunity. Yeah, I know when you were talking about your first cross fence on your operation, you know, you have a lot of people that they go about that in a lot of different ways. And you have people that dive in, you know, feet first, head first, whatever. And, and then you have other people that have to take things just a little bit slower and, and see that gradual change. And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. It right. comes down to your comfort level. And um, we were very much like you. I mean, we started and put one or two cross fences in. And, and then here two years ago, we, you know, dove in and went from on the section that we live on here from basically five pastures to 30 some pastures. So um, yeah, it's, it's all a comfort level. And, um, that's one thing I will say if, if there's any of you on here that are looking at, you know, trying something new, um, our mentor network is amazing. Our producers that we have on that are very willing to share not only probably more so their, uh, failures sometimes than their successes. They're that humble. And, but it's a, it's a great way to learn from somebody else without having to, make you know a mistake yourself and feel uh feel like you did something you know terrible for your operation um and like jerry said i think you build that uh resiliency into your operation i know here oh it's been a couple of years ago now donnie had we had a set of yearling heifers on 160 acres and it's permanently split into 440s and we use polywire to split that down into, oh, it was anywhere from 16 to 32 different cells. But one of those, you know, got, they got left in there a little too long and it, it got pounded to nothing. And Donnie was like, oh my gosh, like, this is awful. And he's like, I didn't even want you to see it, you know, cause I'm like, you know, the grass lady around here. So, um, I, it was the same type of deal though. We just, we left it, we rested it and Mother nature heals itself if you give her the time to do it. And it's, it's being patient and being willing to just kind of set back and let it, let it heal itself. So, um, Dave, I'm going to call you out. You got anything you want to add tonight? Plus you got your video on. So, yeah, well, uh, one, one thing I kind of, you know, you talk about, uh, just cross fencing. Well, I, I went to some meetings and by golly, I was going to make this thing work. And 
And uh, so I thought I had to go out and spend a bunch of money on reels and wires and, and that kind of thing. And, and I've got it. So, so it wasn't a big deal, but uh, I started dividing things up a bunch and really pushing the cattle. And I, and they said it when, when, when I did, when I first did it is you really got to watch the cattle. If, you know, it's just like you said, you can do it, just split up, split a pasture and you'll see a big difference. But if you go all out on it, uh, you really got to watch the cows because they've been in your system on, on a whole cat, on a whole quarter or a whole section pasture. And if you start really pushing them all together, they're not used to that. You know, uh, it's just like if we went to New York city, uh, we, it, it, it would bother us to be that close to that many more people. And, and that's the same way with those cows. If you, if they're used to, if they're used to being in a whole quarter with 20 head and all of a sudden now they're on three acres with 20 head, it, it, it changes their right. uh, senses and, and some go kind of go off feed or, or they get pushed around too much or, and, and they just don't compete well. So, so you have to know that and and you can manage for it it's fine if you you move them quicker or or whatever but but uh when, when you try to change things you you need to be observant and and watch things and and uh and 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 that's what the mentor program is kind of for too is is when you see something you can call somebody and go okay what's happening here i i did this but now i don't understand what i'm seeing you know and right. uh all been there and done that, I guess, sort of deal. So my husband and I listened to a presentation, uh, not from John, but another gentleman from Vince. And it was very interesting. Um, something that I think is kind of a wave of the future. And I think it'll work for some people in certain situations. And it's another tool in the toolbox for some people. So um, kind of a neat deal. But anyway, um, Jerry, thank you again for doing this. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for the night. So hope to see you all on next Thursday. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.